Hello and welcome to another Geometry Lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we'll be doing Unit 8, Lesson 5 on applying right triangle trigonometry. So up until this point, we've used right triangle trigonometry to really do two things. To solve for missing angles and to solve for missing sides in right triangles. And today, all we're going to do is get more practice on that, but in the context of real world problems. Some of which probably aren't going to seem very real world to you. But let's get right into it. All right, now right triangle trigonometry is one of the most applied topics in all of math. It's used in architecture, engineering, physics, and many other fields. In this lesson, we will see a variety of applications to real world problems. And let's start with exercise number one. A ladder will be unstable if it makes an angle with the ground greater than 60 degrees. If a 12 foot long ladder is used to reach a window that is 10 feet above the ground, will it be unstable? Justify your answer. All right, so first let's just make sure we're very clear on something, right? This problem says if the angle that the ladder makes with the ground, which is this angle, is greater than 60 degrees, then the ladder is going to be unstable. So we want to figure out whether it's unstable or not. So in this case, what we're doing is we're going to use trigonometry to find a missing angle, specifically this particular angle. Now we should give it a name. We could call it X, we could call it A, we could call it whatever we want. In higher level math, they oftentimes use Greek letters to stand for angles, specifically things like alpha, beta, theta, gamma, omega, other fancy names. Anyway, I'm going to just use X given that that's something that we're sort of used to using in terms of missing variables. So I'm going to call that angle X, right? And I really just need to figure out whether angle X is greater than 60 degrees. Now, implicit in this type of problem, and in many of the problems that we do, is that we've got a horizontal ground and a vertical something else. In other words, this is a 90 degree angle. And now, of course, we're using trig not to solve for a missing side of a right triangle, but to solve for a missing angle of a right triangle. And I want to do what I always do, which is take a look at my, my angle, take a look at the sides that I'm given, right? I know that the 10 is opposite of that angle, that the 12 is the hypotenuse, and therefore, right, I think about my Sokotoa mnemonic, and the one trig ratio that relates the opposite side to the hypotenuse is the sine ratio. So what do I do? I say the sine of angle X is equal to 10 divided by 12. All right. This is when I now bring in my inverse trig function to figure out my angle. And I'm very good about my notation. I'm going to say X is equal to the inverse sine of 10 twelfths. And now bring out my calculator, go into my trig, go down to my inverse sine, put in my fraction, 10 twelfths, and my calculator is now going to tell me that my angle is 56.44 degrees, right? And it says the latter will be unstable if it makes an angle with the ground greater right, than 60 degrees. Well, the angle that I made with the ground here is only 56.44 degrees, so will it be unstable? No, it will not be unstable since the angle is less than 60 degrees. All right, simple enough. All right, let's keep going. Now, of course, when we're using trigonometry, it can be used to do two things. Solving for missing angles, which is what we did, just did, and solving for missing sides. So let's look at a situation like that in exercise number two. To determine the height of a tree, loggers will measure the angle of elevation to the top of the tree from a set distance from its base. If a logger's eyes are five feet above the ground and the angle of elevation to the top of the tree is 38 degrees, when standing 35 feet from its base, determine the height of the tree to the nearest foot. All right, now just a little piece of terminology, the angle of elevation, okay? So 
If I'm an observer looking at something, right, then I'm looking horizontally. If I have to look up at the top of something, right, the angle that I turn my head in to look at that top, that's the angle of elevation. That's specifically here, right? I've got this logger who's looking out like this. They have to tilt their head up to see the top of the tree. There's devices that you use, surveying equipment, that can then measure that angle very accurately, and they find that that's 35 to 38 degrees. Not 35 degrees, that's the distance they are from the base of the tree. So I need to figure out the height of the tree. Now, what thing, what's a little bit tricky about this is we've got this extra five feet, which for right now I'm gonna ignore, and I'm gonna only work within this right triangle, okay, right here. And in fact, maybe I'll call this distance, since we're getting back into some algebra here, maybe I'll call that distance x, right? Now, I have my 38 degrees, I have my 35 feet, and the x, which I really wanna know, okay? The x is opposite my 38 degree angle. The 35 feet is adjacent to my 30, uh, 38 degree angle. <laughs> and therefore, when I think about my three trig ratios, opposite and adjacent, I wanna use the tangent ratio. And specifically, I can write down the tangent of 38 degrees is equal to the side opposite, x, divided by the side adjacent, 35. Okay, these are the kind that I like, right? Because all I have to do now is multiply both sides by 35. Right, so I'll just do a little bit of this. And now my calculator technology, maybe clear this out. I've got 35 times the tangent of 38 and I will get x is equal to 27 point, let's say, 34 feet. Now, be careful, all right? You don't wanna get sloppy with your notation. You don't wanna confuse the equal sign with give me the answer. I'll get kids that'll write this down, then they'll just do plus five, and they'll, they'll say x is equal to 32.34. Nope, x is equal to 27.34, right? The height of the tree, which is this, right, that's equal to x plus 5. So my height is equal to 27.34 plus 5, which to the nearest foot is 32 feet. All right. And you do have to watch out for this. You know, sometimes your angle of elevation is measured from above the ground, sometimes it's measured right from the ground. Easy enough to take it into account, but always make sure that you're working within a right triangle when you use right triangle trigonometry. All right, let's look at some more exercises where we use right triangle trig. Let's take a look at the steps, applying right triangle trigonometry. Number one, understand whether you're solving for a missing side length or a missing angle measure. That's very, very important. Number two, decide on the appropriate trigonometric ratio that relates your unknown to known quantities. Number three, use the inverse trigonometric functions of solving for a missing angle measure. That was exercise number one. Number four, use algebra and the trigonometric functions if solving for a missing side length. That was exercise number two, all right? So these three, these four steps really walk you through basically any given problem where you're using right triangle trigonometry to either solve for a missing angle or to solve for a missing side. And solving for a missing angle is most certainly easier, right? You set up your trig ratio, you use your inverse trig function to basically tell you what angle has that trig ratio and you're done. Solving for a missing side then tends to involve a little bit of algebra, but only a little bit. So let's take a look at exercise number three and see which of these types we have. An isosceles triangle has legs of length 14 centimeters and a base angle and base and a base <laughs> of length 10 centimeters. What is the measure of its vertex angle to the nearest degree? All right. Well, I'd like you to try, try to draw a good picture and see if you can figure out the answer to this problem. All right. Well, first, let's get ourselves a good picture. Okay, we've got an isosceles triangle. All right, it's got legs of length 14 and a base of length 10. 
Now, I wanna make sure that I understand what I'm looking for. I'm looking for my vertex angle. I'm looking for that, okay? And that is not part of a right triangle yet. Now, to make a right triangle out of this problem, I'm going to drop an altitude, okay? And I'm then going to have two identical right triangles that now look like this. Now I've got kind of two routes that I can go with at this point. I can either try to find the measure of a base angle and then use that to find the measure of the vertex angle, or I can find the measure of this particular angle here and then I'll have to multiply it by two because that's only half the vertex angle. And that's really critical in this case and that's the way I'm gonna go, okay? So I'm gonna call this x Okay, and keep in mind again, your vertex angle is not one of these, but two of them, right? There's an X and an X, but now we're ready, right? I can say that the side of five is opposite. The 14 is the hypotenuse. So opposite and hypotenuse is sine. I can say that the sine of angle X is equal to five divided by 14. That means I'm going to use the inverse sine function to figure out what the value of x is. And let's do that right now. Again, let me just clear this out. I'm going to go to trig inverse sine of 5 fourteenths. And that's going to be 20.924. And now this is absolutely key, right? So that's what the value of x is, but my vertex angle is gonna be equal to 2x. The great thing is that I can literally on my calculator now just do this, times two. Enter, I get 41.849, so my vertex angle to the nearest degree is 42 degrees, right? Simple. And again, this is a good example of where we're using right triangle trigonometry to solve for an angle, okay? But initially, there's no right triangles present, so I have to get one there. Okay, let's keep going. Exercise number four. A lighthouse in Cape Hatteras, North Carolina is 200 feet above sea level. If it spots a boat that is at an angle of depression of 28 degrees, as shown, what is the horizontal distance to the base of the lighthouse, round to the nearest foot? All right, in the first problem we saw, well, actually it was in the second problem, we saw something called an angle of elevation, right? Here we're looking at an angle of depression which is very, very similar. This is the idea that if you've got an observer who's looking horizontally and they have to look down at something, right, they have to look down at something, that the angle that they rotate their vision through, right, that's the angle of depression. So you've got somebody out here in the lighthouse, they're just looking out straight, and they have to rotate down, right, they rotate their vision down to see that boat, all right. This is in fact what lighthouses were used for in the past, okay. They could actually spot, right, and a boat at a certain angle of depression, they, of course, knew if they were sitting in the lighthouse how tall the lighthouse was. That's 200 feet. Maybe I'll mark that right now. Maybe I should have given myself a little bit more room. 200 feet. Okay, and then they can use trigonometry to figure out how close the boat is to crashing into the rocks at the base of the lighthouse. Now, we have to get a right triangle involved. But the key here is that because that is a horizontal line here, and because the C is also at a horizontal line, then these two lines are parallel to each other, which means that this is also a 28 degree angle. All right, those are alternate interior angles created by parallel lines, so therefore they must be congruent or equal in measure. Now, I'm trying to figure out the distance, right, that the base, that the boat is from the base of the lighthouse. Right, that distance I wanna know. Obviously I wanna know that distance. I don't wanna know this distance. Why would I care about that? The boat's not gonna go flying in the air and hit the top of the lighthouse, right? I care about how far the boat has to go 
before it runs into the rocky shore, all right? So what I'd like you to do now is pause the video and relate that 28 degree angle to that 200 feet uh, height of the lighthouse and to the X that we're looking for and see if you can solve for X. All right, well, the 200, right, is opposite our 28 degree angle. The X is adjacent to our 20 degree angle, 28 degree angle. So we're using the tangent ratio, and we can just say that the tangent of 28 degrees is equal to the side opposite to the side adjacent. All right, simple enough. This is one of those problems where the variable that we're solving for is in the denominator of our fraction instead of the numerator. So it takes a little bit more work, but not too much more. Right, we end up getting x times the tangent of 28 degrees is equal to 200. Divide both sides by the tangent of 28 degrees, and we will have our distance. Let's figure that out. Here we go. So I've got 200 divided by the tangent of 28 degrees. That gives me 300 and 76.14, etc. They want it to the nearest foot. So 376 feet. All right, great. And we're seeing this nice variety of problems where we're either solving for angles or solving for lengths. We have to make that decision up front. Then once we know it, we set up our trig ratio and then use it to either solve for our angle using the inverse trig functions or using some algebra in our calculator to solve for a missing side. Let's take a look at one last one. Now sometimes we'll have to use more than one trig ratio to get the job done. And exercise number five is a good example of that. Let's take a look. A blimp hovers above the ground at a height of 1,150 feet. An observer at point A sees the blimp at an angle of elevation of 24 degrees, while an observer at point B sees the blimp at an angle of elevation of 38 degrees. What is the distance to the nearest foot that separates the two observers? Awesome, right? So in this case, there is no natural 90 degree angle yet, or no natural right triangle. But what we can certainly do in this situation is we can break it up into two right triangles. One here, and one here, all right? In both of those situations, we know the length of this particular leg is 1,150 feet, right? We can now do two trig ratios to find these two lengths, and then once we have those two lengths, we can add them together. Now, let's again be good about our mathematical communication, okay? There is a natural tendency to call both of these lengths x. Don't do that, okay? If you use x to stand for one variable in a problem, don't use it to then stand for another variable in a problem. It's bad communication, okay? You don't want to do that. So I'll call this x, and I'll call this y. All right? Now, I need to solve for both x and y, and then add them together, and that's going to give me the distance between the two observers. So what I'd like you to do is take each one of these, see if you can set up a trig ratio, solve for x, solve for y, add them together, and find the distance between these two observers. All right, well, this is a little redundant um, compared to the last problem, right? Because we're gonna use the tangent ratio again. And we're gonna use it again and again, okay? We're gonna use it twice. Because in fact, what we have in both situations is the opposite side, and we're looking for the adjacent side, right? In both situations, that 1,150 feet is the opposite side, and both, both the x and the y are then the adjacent sides in those right triangles. So in one situation, we've got the tangent of 24 degrees is equal to 1,150 divided by x, Right, And when we solve that for x, we're going to get x equals 1,150 divided by the tangent of 24 degrees. 
all right? In the other situation, we've got the tangent of 38 degrees is 1,150 divided by y. And again, because the y's in the denominator, we're eventually going to get y equals 1,150 divided by the tangent of 38 degrees. And of course, what we want is x plus y. Now, you can totally figure out what x is equal to. It's going to be a messy decimal. Figure out what y is equal to. It's going to be a messy decimal. But what's really great is that you don't need to. You can actually just take your calculator, and if you're nice and careful, let's see what we can do. 1,150 divided by the tangent of 24, right, plus 1,150 divided by the tangent of 38, and that will give us our answer. We don't have to worry about rounding or anything. In fact, what's really nice is the calculator actually writes it as that one fraction plus the other fraction. So at the end of the day, that is going to be 4,055 feet. And that is not an unusual thing to have happen with right triangle trig problems, where you have to set up two trig ratios Right? Figure out answers for both of them and then either add them together or subtract them. We'll see that in a problem in the next lesson. All right, let's do a little bit of a wrap up. So today we spent our first of two days on applying right triangle trigonometry. Right? And we saw a variety of problems, but they really boiled down to what we've been doing in the last couple lessons, i.e. using a trig ratio to either solve for a missing angle of a right triangle or a missing side of a right triangle. And I'm not going to go through the general method of how we do either one of those, given that we've spent the last few lessons doing them both. All right? But the thing that I want you to take away from this is that you're getting more practice on those two fundamental skills of, of right triangle trigonometry, while at the same time seeing where and how right triangle trigonometry gets applied in the real world. All right? For now, I just want to thank you for joining me for another geometry lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until I see you again, keep thinking and keep solving problems.